You guys, welcome everybody. Welcome to In the Kitchen. This is our very first episode session of this brand new pilot series. So thank you so much for being with us this morning. In the Kitchen with Chef Joel Gamron is all about connecting military spouses with one another over something that we all need to do and hopefully love to do, which is cook. So we're really excited that you're here with us today. Everyone is welcome to join us on camera and to cook along with us. But if you choose not to be on camera, that's totally fine. You can use the chat box to connect with other people and to ask us any questions about the recipe or techniques or anything as we go along. Um, if you have Q&A questions for the end, like if you wanna ask general questions, totally great. Put them in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to those after our 30 minutes of cooking. So the plan for today is we'll cook for 30 minutes and then we'll save about 30 minutes at the end. If anybody has questions, Chef Joel is gonna stick around and, and answer any questions that you guys have. For those of you who are on camera, we just ask that you stay muted until you have a question or if you need something, feel free to unmute and pipe up. We'd love to hear from you. Um, if anybody did not get the recipe for today, put your email in the chat box and we'll send you an email with the recipe in it right now. Um, and last but not least, we have giveaways today. So we're going to randomly draw some names from everyone joining us live and you will re re be receiving some free giveaway items. So we will email you before the end of the day today and let you know if you've received those. So without further delay, it is my pleasure and my honor to welcome Chef Joel Gamron to, to be with us today. He has written a cookbook called Get Scrappy, and he has a hit TV show called Scraps that you can find on Hulu. He's a dad, and he is the founder and head chef at Homemade, where they offer personalized virtual cooking experiences. They believe at Homemade that everyone should have access to free cooking classes, and they found a way to do it. So you can check them out at withhomemade.com. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Chef Joel. Woo! Good morning from where I am. It could be good evening from where you are, but thank you, Liz. Um, I want to really thank Nicole as well and Mari, uh, all from the USO, just including me, allowing me to be here. Uh, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Like Liz said, I'm Joel. Uh, I'm a chef based here in Seattle, Washington, and feel so grateful uh, to be here with you. Um, I've done some really big events with the USO. When I heard about this and Liz and Nicole brought it up, I thought, oh my gosh, to be talking to spouses, uh, you know, the people who are the foundation of our military, let's be honest, you guys are the ones holding it all up, right? It is such a pleasure. So thank you, thank you for joining me and for allowing me to cook with you guys. Um, the idea behind this, like Liz said, is let's just hang, right? I mean, the best place to hang is in the kitchen. So we thought we'd cook it up a little bit. Uh, I've done this really great challenge with the USO over the past year or so called the five by five. And we came up with this idea because we know a lot of you are stationed all over the world. You only have access to a commissary. In some cases, it could be a smaller one or a bigger one. So we want to come up with the five by five, which means five ingredients and five tools. Nothing more crazy than that, but incredible homemade recipes that you can rock out no matter where you are in the world and uh, they're doable, approachable, and then most importantly, they're insanely delicious. So like Liz said, we want this to be interactive, which makes this, what makes this so cool. It's not like Food Network where you're just watching me. You can talk to me. You can show me your pan. I can see all of you guys who are sharing your kitchen with me. Um, and so that just makes it so much better because I can answer all the questions you guys have. We have a chef actually in the chat. So like Liz said, Feel free to ask any question in there. Um, but, you know, since it's such a small group, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask a question at any time. We want this to feel very casual. Um, without further ado, oh, while we're cooking, like I can see, uh, is it Liesl? How do you say your name? Leslie? <laughs> Tell me. And I see Jason. Liesl? Liesl? Yeah. Awesome. That's a cool name. And I see Hannah with your sous chef. Who's your sous chef there? We have Emma, and this is Luke. Woo! Emma and Luke, what's up? I love it. And we got Jason. I see Jill and Laura. So, guys, I mean, first of all, throw in the chat where you're coming in from. I know a lot of you are overseas. A lot of you are throughout the country. It's just so cool to kind of get a sense of space and, and kind of where everyone is at. But, again, do not hesitate. We are buddies in the kitchen. This is what it's all about. And today, it's about enchiladas, baby. I love enchiladas. It might be my go-to Mexican food order. I mean, I love a good taco, 
Not, not, you know, and I actually love a fajita, but there's something about an enchilada that's more comforting. It's a little bit more, I don't know, saucy, it just kind of hits you in the soul a little bit more. So we are making a five by five enchilada. This is a really easy recipe. We asked for five ingredients. So I'm going to show you guys what we got right here. So first and foremost, you need your favorite cheese and this should be something shreddable, right? So I've got a good sharp cheddar here. But you can use, you know, any cheese honestly will work. But you need a good half a pound or so of cheese. Then I need you guys to find your favorite salsa. So we need three cups of this salsa. So you could use a green salsa, red salsa. They even make kind of like black bean salsas now, which would be really cool with this. But a nice big three-cup jar of salsa. And then couple of little chicken cutlets, which I think most of us can find. If you don't do chicken, you can obviously totally take it out or put sweet potato in place of it or broccoli or tofu uh, or salmon. Honestly, I've had salmon enchiladas. Don't knock it until you try it. It's awesome. So if you're not a chicken fan, that's totally cool. Corn tortillas. Okay, guys, don't go with the flour. Look at me right now. No flour tortillas. Corn tortillas are what makes this sweet and delicious. So try and find corn tortillas. And then last but not least, we asked for sour cream. If you can't find sour cream, go with yogurt. Um, you can go with ricotta. Just something to give it a little bit of depth. Now, I'm adding an optional sixth ingredient. You don't need it. It's going to make it look pretty. But if you can find some cilantro or parsley or basil or mint, all that would be really good for the finish, or if you have any in the in the fridge, but that's totally optional. So how are we doing? Any questions on those ingredients? Oh, Laura gave me a little, I love it, raise the roof. Laura, I haven't seen that since like 2001. I love it. It's my girl. Yeah. And I'm rocking my mom's apron from maybe the 70s. Yes, I love it. That's a very cool apron. Very cool apron. I love it. Where are you based, Laura? Based in um, Anchorage, Alaska, but I'm visiting family in Virginia right now. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks for joining. All right, guys. So step one, I need two kind of little skillets, all right? And earlier, Liz was asking me, she was like, is this deep enough? Is, as long as it's something you would make an omelet in, right, or eggs or something like that, it's going to work. So I need two skillets. They don't need to be the same size. I want to start with one skillet on like a medium high heat. So I want you to turn on the heat, like a seven out of 10, all right? So turn that on and kind of just get that warming up. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my salsa. Now, this is a whole ingredient. Obviously, you can make your own salsa, right? And, and do this your, yourself. If you have tomatoes growing in the garden or if you have access to really, really good onions, make your own salsa, but there's so many good store-bought salsas now. So this is just something that saves you time, obviously saves you a lot of trips to the grocery store or to the commissary. So I need three cups of salsa and I'm gonna pour it all into this pan, all right? And you can go with smooth, you can go with a little bit more chunk, whatever your vibe is. I'm curious on what everyone found or what everyone's favorite salsa is. Does everyone like spicy here or not? Spicy crew or not really, yeah? Be mild all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't know. Oh, nice. What, what, oh, Lisa, that's a cool brand. Where is that? Sweet. What is that? I don't know. It's probably Mex. It's probably Mexican. I'm in El Paso, so. Oh, so you got the good stuff. You got the really good stuff. This is the good Mexican area. <laughs> I feel like you could get some homemade tortillas too somewhere around there. Oh, yeah. Ugh, I so I like um, Liz said. I had a cooking show on Hulu called Scraps. And we filmed kind of Santa Fe, New Mexico, El Paso area. And it was during this time of year where there was something in the air smell-wise. And they were roasting all these poblano chilies. It's like this one time of year where on the street they just have these big baskets. And they're roasting all these chilies over an open fire. It was the coolest thing ever. And you could smell it for miles and miles and miles. I'll never forget that. Very cool part of the country, Liesl. All right. So... <clears throat> I've got my salsa. It's kind of coming up to like a little bit of a simmer. You can see some bubbles happening there, right? So what I want to do next is I want to get our chicken cutlets. And really, really simply, I'm just going to season it with a little bit of salt. Don't need to add pepper. There's enough chili in the actual salsa. So I, when I add salt, you guys, I always kind of sprinkle from up high. Does anyone know why? Why not just like 
really close? Why is it important? Besides the fact that you look cool, why sprinkle from up high with your hand? So that the salt is evenly distributed? Who said that? Jill, you are a goddess. Thank you. Yes, so if I salt the board here so you can see, my hand is really close, you get one spot of the board. If my hand's really high up, it really spreads out. So for steaks, you know, for anything that you're seasoning, always hold your hand up high. And again, you look very chefy by doing it. So we're gonna take our chicken cutlets and just lay them into the salsa, all right? <clears throat> and you're gonna see the bubbles kind of go down in the salsa just a little bit because you're basically adding cold, you know, you're basically adding ice cubes to the salsa. But we're just gonna kind of top the salsa up with that chicken and let it simmer away. Now, everyone always asks me, okay, like what does simmering really mean? So simmering and boiling. Boiling is like pasta water, where it's like really vigorous bubbles, like hot tub bubbles, big, big bubbles. Simmering is more like gentle bubbles, smaller bubbles, um, where it's not as loud and you can just see a couple kind of happening around the outside here. So you don't wanna boil this or the chicken can get a little rubbery. So just simmering it is kind of a nice, it's a gentler way of kind of treating the meat. Um, and that's just a good tip to know. If you ever got, you know, if you're laying fish into water and you're poaching fish or anything, just wanna do a nice simmer. How are we doing? Any questions so far, team? You guys are awesome. Easy peasy. All right. So chicken is happening. I'm going to throw the lid on top. If you don't have a lid, I, we, I, I cook scrappy. You could use the back of a plate. You can use tin foil. You could throw your cutting board over the top. I don't care. Whatever you got. But you just want to kind of have the steam go back over the chicken. Cool. Now, next step to the most unbelievable enchiladas, like I said, corn tortillas. I like them because they're a little sweeter. Um, the problem with corn tortillas is when they come to you, they're kind of like dry. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, they're, they're, I mean, they're flimsy, but it's like, if I just ate this right now, it's gross. Like, I, it's not good. So we got to kind of like hydrate these tortillas, make them malleable, give them a little bit of something. So with your other skillet, I want to turn that on a, about a medium high heat. I would say another like seven out of 10. And I want everyone to grab some vegetable oil, all right? And I want to put enough vegetable oil in my pan where it kind of coats the bottom of the pan. So it's a decent amount of vegetable oil. You're almost like shallow frying. Beautiful. And while this is happening, you guys can preheat your ovens, if you don't mind, to 375 degree Fahrenheit. I wonder if anyone is like, in a place where there's not Fahrenheit, it's more Celsius. I, I did not come with the conversion. <laughs> there you go. I bet that's weird to kind of get used to, right? I lived in Italy for a year and it was like, you guys don't use cups to measure? What is every, like, how do you get, and it, you realize that the cups are terrible. The scale is where it's at. Does anyone have, uh, is anyone overseas? No? I am, oh, I'm in Germany. Oh, nice. Oh, that's awesome, Jill. Very cool. Was it easy to find some of this stuff, Jill? Well, actually, no. Um, we are, our commissary is out of um, corn tortillas. They've been out of corn tortillas for about the last month. So I had to get flour because corn tortillas aren't re readily available here in the economy. Uh, but, okay, so two things. One is flour is going to work, and it's going to still taste good. It's not going to taste as good. But I'm going to send you a recipe, if you don't mind, sharing your email with Liz and I'll send you a recipe on how to make the easiest corn tortillas. So if you can't find them, you should be able to make them and they'll be better anyway. So that will be a good little thing. Sweet. Yeah, of course. So guys, medium high heat on this oil. And I want to start with like one or two tortillas at a time, probably just one. And you want to give it like a light fry. Okay. And literally you don't need to spend any more time than like 30 seconds. So grab some tongs. Watch me. See how it's bubbling on the outside? And I just kind of turn it. So I'm just lightly frying these. And you're not, you're not trying to get brown or anything like that. You're just kind of softening it up. And then I just put it onto a little paper towel. I'm going to do seven more of these. So, well, plenty of time. I've got eight all together. So tortilla in for about 30 seconds, right? About 15 seconds in. I give it a quick flip. 
and then I'm going to put it on a paper towel just to kind of drain a little bit of that excess oil. But this is going to make the tortilla so much more flavorful and be a lot easier to work with. So while we're frying these, Liz, I know there were some questions kind of entered before the actual event. What questions came to you? All right. So one of the first ones that we got is, uh, what are your suggestions for finding alternative ingredients for favorite recipes? Like if they depend on commissary supplies. Yeah. So like how to find, you're saying like, when to kind of know when to kind of take an ingredient and swap it out for a different ingredient? Yeah, like like what you just told Jill about, um, you know, she couldn't find corn. It was okay to use flour, but you can also make it. So you, do you have any other convenient swaps? Um, I'm trying to think of things that commissaries are often out of. Yeah, tell me what they're often out of and I can tell you. But I would say that in cooking, 99% of ingredients can be swapped. So most of the time you can swap ingredients. So if you, for whatever reason, are really craving, I don't know, pizza and you can't find tomato sauce, there's salsa to that, right? You can find jarred peppers and grind that up into a tomato, like into a sauce. You can make a white sauce. So there's lots of, you know, I, I feel like that's one of the biggest things is sometimes you do go to the grocery store or the commissary and you're just like, oh, bummer. Like they don't have what I was looking for know that there is another way. If it just means jumping on your phone real quick and saying, hey, I want to make pizza and I don't, I can't find flour. Cool. There's so many other options nowadays online. So um, I guess my big tip is don't be disheartened. There are some good swaps out there. What's another question? Well, I just saw Anna say that her commissary is almost always out of ricotta cheese. And I make a oh, lot yeah. of lasagna. I come from an Italian family. So yeah. what could you use in place of ricotta? Yeah, so I actually don't use ricotta in my lasagna, um, but I will say that I really, really like bechamel, which is a sauce that you can make with milk and flour. So that's a really great replacement in your lasagna. It makes it really creamy and delicious. If you can't find that, goat cheese is really, really good. And if you can't find that, even something as simple as like um, uh, cottage cheese. I know that seems a little bit weird, but it's basically the same thing as ricotta. So... Easy peasy swap there. That's good to know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, someone else had asked if this recipe that we're making, is this prep ahead or freezer friendly? Can we pop these enchiladas in the freezer? Oh, heck yeah, guys. I almost like, you know, it's so funny when people come over to my house, they're like, why is it like everything's clean? Everything's organized because chefs like to do prep ahead more than anyone else. That's, that's how we at restaurants, when we get an order, we know how to do it really, really quick. So when people come over or when the family sits down, we're very used to prep ahead. So absolutely, these enchiladas are amazing. What I like to do with them is get them all the way cooked, and then they freeze for up to six months with just a little plastic wrap over the top. If you don't want to cook them, if you just want to assemble them, they'll stay good in the fridge with plastic wrap for up to five days. Cool? Very cool. Yeah, how's everyone's tortillas working out, guys? Everyone have some... Nice kind of soft tortillas happening. Let's see. Jason, you cool? Thumbs up. Hannah, you cool? Yeah? Good, 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 good. They should just be flexible. Nothing crazy, right? If you let those tortillas sit in there too long, they're going to become like a chip or, you know, uh, a little tostada when they're fried like that. But you should have at least eight of these, okay? Now... Real quick, well, first of all, let me just see thumbs up. Liz, how are you doing with yours? I'm doing great. I'm also team flour tortillas. My kids don't do corn for some reason, so we've always got flour tortillas in the house. So I'm, I'm kind of trying out the flour. Listen, it's a personal preference. I'm a corn fan. Some people love the flour thing, so I'm sure the kids will love it. It's still going to soak up the sauce and be delicious. Um, while the corn tortillas are kind of either – you're on your last couple being kind of crisped um, or you're done, I want you to grade your cheese. If you already have grated cheese, that's totally great. But I'm going to grade, again, about a half a pound of cheese on the thickest grade of my cheese grater. And if you don't have a cheese grater, you can literally just chop the cheese, right? So again, don't feel like you need every kitchen tool in the world. I'm sure if you're stationed somewhere where it's not home, you just didn't bring everything. So don't worry if you don't have a cheese grater. 
It's so funny. The other day I was teaching a class. I was a baked item. And they were like, someone came on and they go, what happens if you don't have a mixer? I go, oh, well, you can just use like a bowl and a whisk. And they go, what if you don't have a whisk? And I'm like, I guess you could use a fork. And they're like, what if you don't have a fork? And I'm like, what are you cooking with? What do you, what do you, what do you have? Just use your, I guess just use your hand. You know, it was so funny. I guess you could. I mean, hey, you got to use what you got. Right? That's a military thing and definitely a cooking scrappy thing. All right. So I've got all my cheese kind of shredded up. I do want to take half the cheese, guys. Half the cheese, put it to the side. Right? And half the cheese and put it to the other side. So we're going to split it up. One's going to go over the top of the enchiladas. One's going to go actually into the enchiladas. Cool. How we doing? Any questions? Making sense? What I love about this is that no one ever cooks in salsa. Oh, yeah. Bring it. Um, when you freeze them or make a head, how, what do you do with the tortillas so that they don't, like, start to, like, peel or fall apart or, like, you know, get too soggy from the sauce? Yeah. So the whole point of this is that they're actually going to soak. You want them to get soaked into the sauce. But as they set, they won't fall apart. So as long as you cook them ahead of time, right, instead of putting them in the freezer raw, they're going to be perfect. They're going to they're not going to get soggy or fall apart. If you put them in the freezer raw, it might get a little bit like that, Roxana. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. yeah. and they won't in the fridge, it won't fall apart either. So 5 days in the fridge if you don't cook it is absolutely great. When we first had our first kid, it was so funny. People brought over enchiladas and they were like, "Stick it in your freezer." We had like 3 friends bring over enchiladas. They were so good. Uh, you know, weeks later. So, it's a really really good make ahead meal. All right, so I'm looking at my chicken right now. I took the lid off. And again, I was just about to say, I think it's really cool to cook in salsa. I think we all just think of salsa as a dip or like a condiment. But think about what salsa is. It's onions, it's tomatoes, it's a little bit of spice. So it is a sauce, right? It's nothing more than a sauce. So this smells really delicious. And my chicken is totally cooked. I can see that um, if I pull it apart with a couple of forks, you can kind of see that it's white all the way through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my chicken and put it into a little bowl. All right. So I want everyone to do the same thing. So I'm taking it out of the sauce, putting it into a little bowl. All right. Is everyone tracking? Thumbs up. I just don't want you, you guys to think I'm going too fast. Everyone's doing a good job. Let me see thumbs. Jason's got thumbs. Anna, you got thumbs. Hannah, you got thumbs. Laura, you got thumbs. Jill, sweet. Kanye, great. Jamie's cooking. I love it. Roxana, thumbs up. Making sense? Roxana, who's you? You didn't tell me who your sous chef was. Who's that cutie? This is Eleonora. Oh, hi, Eleonora. Good to meet you. We're going to make them later. Love it. And you'll see a perfect time is coming up for Eleonora to get hands on with you. So with this chicken, guys, it's totally cooked through, white all the way through. I'm going to take my forks and just shred it while it's hot. A lot easier to do this while it's hot, guys. Don't wait for that chicken to cool down. Not a good time to go check email or catch that episode of Real Housewives or whatever. This is a good time. When the chicken comes out, you want to shred it. All right. So shred it nice and good. And you don't, you know, I don't like to shred the chicken so it's like stringy. I like to keep it a little bit like chunky so you, so people bite into it. They're like, oh, this is like really good fresh chicken. I think some people like pulled pork and stuff. They just take it a little far. And I like mine just a little bit more, you know, a little bit more chewy. It's a good thing. All right. So I'm shredding the chicken. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab little bit of this sauce, and I say sauce, but it's the salsa that we actually cooked the chicken in. And I'm going to literally pour just a little bit, like I would say a quarter cup, over the chicken in the bowl. This is just going to kind of moisten the chicken, cover it with some good sauce. You can kind of mix that sauce with the chicken in the bowl. Nothing crazy there. Then... I want to take half my cheese and add it to the chicken as well. 
So we're literally just going to kind of like in this one bowl with the cooked chicken, add a little sauce, add a little bit of the cheese, and mix that through. And I, I like to always give it a little salt in there just to make sure everything's seasoned nice. This looks really good. And this is, again, guys, this is a part where if your kids or your family, if they want certain vegetables in here, mix them in. If you want to put peas in here or cauliflower or sweet potato or this is a spot to do it. So whatever you have in the fridge, this is where you kind of mix it into. Cool. So we've got this nice mixture of cheese and chicken, a little bit of the sauce. I'm going to push this to the side. How's everyone doing? I'm checking in on my crew. Thumbs up. Everyone's all right. This is pretty easy, right? You guys are doing it. Sweet. Okay. Smells good too. It smells so good. My dog has joined me. <laughs> That's the best. My dog has joined me too. <laughs> I was asking, uh, who was I asking before? I think it was Trisha. I was saying, you, or Trish, yeah. And I said, do you have kids? She goes, I have three dogs. I'm like, oh man, you have your hands full more than kids. Three dogs. That is what's up, Trish. Are they big dogs? You didn't tell me. Small or big? Little, little bit of everything. I kind of have the Sprint commercial. I've got a 12 pound, a 40 pound, and a 95 pound. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you have your hands full, all right. That's for sure. All right, so now. Hey, yeah. Here, here a quick question from Rosa. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. If I wanted to flavor my oil before I fry my tortillas, Mm. What kind of pepper would you use? Mm, I love I love the way you're thinking. So first of all, genius idea. You could throw... So when you say pepper, you mean like chili pepper? Like a chili pepper, like a poblano or serrano or... Yeah, 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 yeah. So I like the, tr the, the dried chili peppers for this. They have a little bit of a caramel flavor. So I would look for either uh, dried poblanos, which I think are a little bit fruity and delicious... Um, or if you can find dried Anaheims, they're really, really good too. Those are the bigger ones. They're kind of chocolatey. Um, but yeah, it's a great idea, Rosa. Another thing you guys can do is just take some garlic. You don't even have to peel it. Leave it in the skin and put that in the oil before the tortillas and you make this kind of garlic oil, which would be really nice. I love the idea of flavoring oil, Rosa. I'm taking that idea. It's a good one. I love it. All right, so you guys... Especially if you have kids, this is kind of the moment of truth here to assemble these tort or these enchiladas. So it's really, really easy. First, I grabbed kind of a big baking pan, right? You can just use another saucepan. It doesn't have to be something like this. But whatever you would cook like lasagna in or something like that, a casserole dish, right? So grab one of those. Everyone grab one. Show it to me. I want to see it. See what everyone's got. Okay, perfect, Liz. Nice, Hannah. Perfect, Jill. That's great. Yeah, Kenya, that's great. Laura, perfect. Great, perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to take a little bit of this sauce, right? And I'm going to put about another quarter cup on the bottom of the tray like this. You can just take a fork and you can just spread it all to kind of the little corners of the tray. So it kind of looks like this. You want to go to top down, Deb, so everyone can see? Literally, it just looks like, you know. And this is going to kind of act as a base or some glue for our enchiladas. So we're going to roll up the enchiladas and they're going to stay put because we have our beautiful kind of base sauce in there. So at this point, it's pretty darn simple. You just grab one of these tortillas that are still warm from you giving them a light fry. You grab a little bit of this cheese chicken mixture. And I put it a little bit kind of closer to my belly button. So I don't put it right in the middle of the tortilla, a little bit kind of on the inside. And then I just roll it on up, right? And then I just place that little puppy right into my dish. And you're just going to keep going, right? Try and get as much in there without it sp spilling out as possible. They're, they're really nice when they're really tightly kind of wound up. But um, please. Well, I'm a vegetarian and a pescatarian. So what are yeah. my meat options? I mean, I, I have been saying the whole time, this is so easy to turn into either one. So first and foremost, I've had this with salmon and it rocks. I know you're thinking salmon and cheese sounds weird. It really, really works. I love mushrooms in this, like portobello mushrooms instead of the chicken. 
So that would be a really nice kind of meaty option that's not meat. Um, eggplant is amazing in this. Um, and like I said, sweet potato is surprisingly delicious with this. Just gives it a little bit of creaminess and heft. So hopefully that, that helps. Good, of course, of course. What else? Any other questions while we start rolling? How's everyone's tortillas? Did they stay nice and uh, soft? Thumbs up? Yeah, everyone's so folk. What's that? I said, I have a quick question because yeah. um, often when I work with tortillas, even if I cook them a little bit, they still just really fall apart on me. Is mm. there any secret to getting them to stay together while you're handling them? I promise you, as long as you give them 30 seconds in hot oil, they won't fall apart. But I would also say that you could run them over under hot water just to loosen them up or stick them in the microwave for like 30 seconds. The key is, is that they're really brittle when they're um, sitting in that package. So you've got to give some, a little heat to it just to kind of get it flexible. If you don't do that, I'm so with you. They always fall apart on me. But if you give them some heat, I promise they won't course guys look how nice this is looking so i'm kind of just stacking these up close together you guys can kind of see i'll do a little top down view and you can see my my sheet tray is kind of a little bit small to put so i'm going to start putting them lengthwise here don't worry they don't have to be perfect we're not martha stewart here make it look homemade right that's always tasting better when it doesn't look perfect i always feel like imperfect is what we are after beautiful all right, so I'm going to nestle this guy in here. What else, guys? Any other questions? What are some of your favorites to cook right now? I'm just curious. Joel, I was going to say we've made the sweet potato ones, um, yeah. not with enchilada sauce, but just in tortillas, and my daughter really loves them. They're really good. I'm and you can even you. just use um, beans, too. I Totally. Yes. I didn't know why I didn't think about that. Yes. Just some beans and the cheese would be absolutely delicious and super quick. Pop open a can of beans. It's a no brainer. All right. So mine are all rolled up and kind of nestled in. And again, you can do it in any kind of form you want. Here's what mine look like, but you can absolutely, I mean, if you really want to go you know, fancy schmancy, you could go lengthwise, more like this. It does not matter. As long as that they're all in there, kind of tucked into their sauce, they're going to be in good shape. All right. So I'm going to pause here. I want to look for everyone's enchiladas. I know you guys are all rolling. Take your time. There's no rush here. But this is the part where I love to, you know, bring in the kiddos, um, you know, this is a family affair. I, I, I tell this story a lot, but I studied in Italy and we would make raviolis with a bunch of just grandmas. They taught me how to make homemade raviolis and you would sit there for hours filling the raviolis and kind of pleating the dough. And, and you know what you do when you, do? you gossip, you hang, you have some wine, you turn on some music. And so that's what I love about cooking is like, we all get around the table, maybe, you know, we're rolling some tortillas. Great. You know, talk about your day. You, you just chill. I think that's what I love about Liz's and Nicole's concept here of kitchen connections. Like that is, this is the glue. Kitchen is the glue. Cooking is the glue, which I love. All right. Let's see everyone's enchiladas. I'm curious. Yeah, Liz. Woo. Easy peasy. All right. I see a couple more people rolling. Take your time. So. We have time for a couple more questions while we're waiting for everyone to roll. Liz, what you got? I got some from people who registered. So we have a lot of people interested in like meal planning again, because especially right now during the pandemic, you can't get to the store every day and you maybe yeah. don't want to. So do you have any tips for meal planning on a budget and not overbuying things? That's a great question. So first and foremost, I cook a lot on Sundays. It depends on your week, but you got to choose one day of your week where you do a lot of the cooking. So on Sundays, I tend to go to the grocery store, come home, and I'll make rice for the week. I'll actually boil pasta for the week, and I'll have them in big kind of containers, and then I'm able to kind of adjust those throughout the week. So I'll take that pasta maybe one day, 
and I'll have some chicken and I'll have a chicken pasta with broccoli, right? The next day, I might just put a little bit of olive oil and vinegar over the top of the pasta and make a pasta salad. So having those things done ahead of time makes a big difference for meal planning for the rest of the week. Using your freezer is crucial. I think a lot of people think frozen food is not as good. Guys, the freezer is the key to meal planning and not overbuying. So if you feel like something's going bad, use the freezer, pop it in there, use it again later in a couple of weeks. The freezer should be your best friend. Um, but when I go to the grocery store, I get grains, I get proteins, and I get vegetables. And then throughout the week, I just kind of do new and different types of spins on each one. And hopefully with Kitchen Connections in this new program, you get inspired to kind of use this stuff in new ways. If you have cooked chicken, you know, you might make enchiladas one night, but tomorrow night you might make, uh, you know, uh, chicken stir fry. So that's totally what this is all about. Great question, Liz. What else? Uh, somebody wants to know, what is your favorite dish to prepare? Ooh, okay. I'm a big risotto fan. Does everyone here like risotto? I love it. I love it. Yes. So uh, it's so funny. On a lot of these cooking competitions that you see on TV, risotto is always what sends people home. So it's a lot of people think it's hard to make. It's really easy to make. And like I said, I studied in Italy, so I have a really good risotto recipe. So maybe on the next one, we'll do a really delicious risotto. But I love it. it to me, it's a one-pot meal. It's like mac and cheese, but fancy. It's, it's totally my vibe. Yeah. All right, guys. So everyone's enchiladas in good shape. I saw Liz's. Jason, let's see yours. Hannah. Oh, yeah. Lisa. What's up? Hannah. Yes. Yeah, it's getting there. It's getting there. Laura, you doing good? Thumbs up. Good, good. I know you guys are busy with it. That's good. So right when you have all these rolled up, I want to go ahead and take the rest of the sauce from the pan, pour it over the top, and really make sure you distribute the sauce evenly. Like if you need to grab a little back of the spoon and spread it out, do it. Like just kind of get it into all the little nooks and crannies. And this is a great question. I know, um, I forgot who asked it, but uh, earlier who said, you know, they're really worried about the tortillas getting soggy. They will not get soggy if you gave them a light fry at this point. So you can put it literally in your fridge once we top this with cheese for five days, it will go great. But at this point, I want to take the rest of that cheese and I want to sprinkle it everywhere. Right? I mean, it's cheese, guys. You can't really overdo it with the cheese. But I like to leave a little bit of the tortillas peeking through so I can see a little bit of the actual tortilla. That way, the oven kind of crisps up those edges and they get crunchy, which I like. So it's nice to have a little bit of space between the cheese and the tortillas. But this is what mine looks like. We'll go to a little close-up so everyone can see here. It almost looks like lasagna, right? Super easy. Just promise me do not freeze it here. You have to cook it and then freeze it if you're going to hold it for another time. All right. Sweet. All right. So enchiladas are ready to go. I'm going to pop these into, again, we had our 375 degree Fahrenheit oven. And they're going to go for about 25 minutes. At the 25 minutes, take a look at them. They should be gooey, a little brown on top. You might need to leave them in there for 30 minutes, depending on you know your oven. So if it needs to go for another five, just to make sure you get the color you want, that's totally fine and normal. But I wanted to kind of show you guys what this looks like as it comes out. So I'm going to put mine in. And of course, in the magic of TV, these are what they look like. So really golden brown on the outside. Can I get a little virtual round of applause here from my military spouses? Thank you, thank you. So you can see, see how crispy these get by leaving a little bit of that cheese? So absolutely delicious. Now here's the key, guys. Do not face plant into this right out of the oven. You will burn your, your tongue and they will fall apart. Just like lasagna, you want to let them set. So tell your kids, back off. Everyone, back off. 10 minutes, let them just hang out and kind of solidify, and they'll be a lot easier to scoop out. But there's one more ingredient I want to top this with, and that is the sour cream. We're going to make our own little crema. I know it's really hard to find crema, unless you're based in El Paso, like our friend. But um, 
If you can't find crema, it's like a it's like a thinner sour cream. It's a little bit more of a dressing, a drizzle. So I just put half a cup or a third of a cup of sour cream in a bowl, and I just add a little bit of water, a couple tablespoons of water, and I just mix that in. Right, simple as that, and it's gonna thin it out. This is how a lot of salad dressings like ranch, um, Parmesan peppercorn, this is how they're made, guys. It's by taking sour cream, a little bit of mayo, and thinning them out a little bit. But you can see the texture change totally. And you just want to get this to a point where you can drizzle it. And then, once it's drizzleable, dri that's a word, drizzleable, you just get in there with your spoon, and you literally just go Jackson Pollock on top of these enchiladas. I'm going to show you what I mean by that. This is the most, I would say, stress relieving part of this dish. So I take my enchiladas, <clears throat> I grab my little homemade crema, which is nice and thin, and then you just kind of like go nuts, right? There's no rhyme or reason. And this is obviously after you cool them down. On top of that, I take a little bit of cilantro if you want it, rip it up, just the leaves, and uh, you guys, these are enchiladas, the five by five. Hot enchiladas, beautiful enchiladas. That is what it's all about. Our first five by five with the with the military spouses. I'm so excited to see how yours turn out. Um, I think this is an example of like how Instagram worthy is this? How beautiful is this? And it literally was five ingredients, five tools, and that took us like 30 minutes, not even. I mean, if I wasn't yapping away, it would probably take you guys like, 20 minutes to make, 15 minutes to make, and then you just pop it in the oven. So super easy, impressive, and indulgent recipe. I hope you guys love this one. And I want to take a pause for more questions, thoughts. What do you guys want to learn next? I know we talked about risotto, but I'm open to so many different ideas. What are you thinking? Thank you, Chef Joel. I have a question. Actually, first, I'm going to monopolize the mic for just a minute. When we lived in Okinawa, Japan, it was really hard to find sour cream. It just wasn't something you could easily find on the island. So I purposely used plain Greek yogurt today. So when you're making the crema, is it the same thing with Greek yogurt as it would be for sour cream? 100%. And I actually sometimes prefer Greek yogurt. So I love that you got that, Liz. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. What else? Any other questions? I had a question. Does the water have to be warm or is it just room temperature? Yeah, just room temperature right out of the faucet is totally fine. Okay. And if I don't okay. cook it right now and I want to keep it for dinner and just put it in the fridge, will that be still okay? Totally. It will stay good. This will stay good in the fridge, even just like this for a couple of weeks. So it's totally good. I'm oh, sorry. I'm talking about en uh, enchiladas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want to cook them and then put them in the fridge after they're cooked? Uh, I was thinking just leaving it like that. I know you said not to put them in the freezer like that, but yes. what about So once it's assembled, Katya, just stick them in the fridge and they'll be good right before dinner. That's perfect. Yes. I love it. I had a question. Uh, yellow corn or white corn? <laughs> That's a personal preference. That's a personal preference. I, they really... Yeah, it really, really is just depending on what you like. I'm a yellow corn guy. I think it's a little bit sweeter, but... You know, it's hard to really tell the difference between the different corns. And I'm telling you, I know some people are using flour tortillas. Some people like flour. It's just kind of where you're at, what your vibe is. Um, my wife hates corn tortillas, so I'm surprised I'm, I'm using them right now. Well, white's normally harder for me to, like, get to stay together. But when the way you did it was much better. Yeah, get you know, it, it it's kind of feels... Yeah, Liesl, it feels like an extra step to give it that little fry, but that fry really makes it malleable and easy to work with. So, yeah, glad that worked. How did it work with the flour tortillas to give it a little quick fry? Did that work pretty okay? Yeah? No prob? Good. Good. I love it, guys. All right, so there's a couple more questions here. I'm going to read them out. So there's so many kitchen gadgets in the world, panini press, uh, air fryers, What's my top kitchen gadget? Oof, oof, you guys. First of all, I think air fryers are pretty cool. I'm going to call it out right now. I think Instapots are pretty cool too. I mean, at all those, they're, they're worth the hype is what I'm saying. But to me, I have kind of like a set five of my favorite. They're not gadgets, but like tools that I absolutely love. So first and foremost, 
I love this. This is called a microplane. It's for cheese and chocolate, lemon zest. It's like 15 bucks on Amazon. Microplane. I love this. All chefs love this. So try and find a microplane. The next one I would say is I love this. This is a fish spatula. I don't use it just for fish. I use it for everything, but it's a bendy spat spatula. And it's for fish because fish can tear and rip. So it's a lot easier on things like chicken, even these enchiladas, like pulling them out, it makes it a lot easier to kind of like actually get whatever you want out of the pan. So fish spatula is another tool I really love. I'm not going to go through all of mine, but I'll go uh, one more that I absolutely think is a non-negotiable. All right. For $4. Anyone know what this is called? You guys look so confused. You're like, what is that? Yes. Yes, Lisa, yet. Yeah. This is a bench scraper. Why I love it is, you know, when you have garlic, onion, anything you chop up, you just literally scrape it, right, onto the scraper, into the pan. It saves your knives. When you do it with your knife, your knife goes dull. I also just love this for cleaning up. Like sometimes there's just a mess, like all this cheese here. I mean, like literally just scrapes up the board. So it's like four bucks and look at, I mean, it just does it for you. So for me, I use favorite tools. I'm going to say those are my probably three favorite tools in the kitchen besides a good chef knife. Hopefully that helps. Appliance wise, I don't know, guys. Do you guys use immersion blenders, those stick blenders that you put in? I love those. I love those because... Sometimes when you're making a soup or when you want to blend something, it's just so annoying to like take this and go into the actual blender. It just makes a big mess. So to just put a blender into the actual pan is something I love. All right, I'm going to address another question here. What do we got, Dev? Pull it up for me. All right, my 18-year-old is very interested in helping me in the kitchen. Do you have any safe ideas for getting her involved in cooking? So first and foremost, oh, is that 18-year-old or 18-month-old? Let's see. 18 month old. I'm like 18 year old. They can get in there. Uh, 18 month old. Yeah. So I have a 22 month old who, and he sees me in the kitchen every day. I'm in my, like I've turned my garage into a little cooking studio. He comes in here, he runs around, he's obsessed with clinking all the pots and stuff like that. So first and foremost, I put him up next to me. I have that little kind of like, it's like a chair, but you kind of put it up next. It's very safe for them. I make sure everything sharp is away from him and everything spillable is away from him. And I just let him go to town with spoons and pots and pans. He's my salt guru. I'll say, can you add salt into here? He picks up salt, puts it in there. He knows what salt means. I let him stir. So those are kind of the big things I would start kitchen, you know, kids off in the kitchen with. But he would do a great job of, of if I said, hey, can you put this chicken and cheese in this little tortilla? He would do that. So I think whenever you're assembling cookies or shaping things with dough, it's perfect to get kind of younger kids involved. I'll tell you, I have taught thousands of kids how to cook, thousands in in uh, cooking camps, um, typically eight years old to 12 years old, and then 13 year olds to 18 year olds. They, it changes their life, guys. They eat so much better. They're so much more open to trying foods when they're the ones making it. So I'm just, my advice from a chef to a parent, try and get kids involved in cooking at an early age. It really does open their horizons. I was a really picky eater until I started cooking. I know that. What else? Liz, you got anything else on yours? Oh, let's see here. <laughs> How do you address cleaning up? Do you Are you team like clean up as you go or are you team clean it up when we're all finished? I'm team clean up as you go. I'm also team clean up. If you do the cooking, your spouse does the clean up. So I think that you got to share the responsibilities, but I do think if you can clean up as you go, it's good. I, that doesn't mean going and scrubbing out the pan. That might mean like washing the board, kind of making sure the, the surface is all clean, but it doesn't mean you have to do everything. But I would try and get like 80% of the cleaning done as you go, especially, you know, enchiladas are in the oven. Go, go take on a little, you know, a little dish sesh. Who cares? You're already there. Throw on some music, pour a little glass of wine. So that, that's kind of my thought. Do you have a favorite side dish that you would serve with the enchiladas? You know, they're so cheesy. And they're so heavy in a good way. I might go with just a nice little side salad with lime and olive oil 
over the top of it because you just don't want anything heavy with it. I know traditionally it's served with rice and beans. I always feel like that's just a lot. So I would do that, maybe throw some avocado in there so it feels a little bit you know, different. But I, I would try and kind of balance, whenever you see something that's a gut bomb, balance it with something a little bit lighter. Yeah. Hey, real quick, um, yeah. that crema you talk about crema, is that the same thing as the creme fraiche they sell over here in Europe? It's very similar, Jason. From a texture standpoint, it's almost identical. But creme fraiche is actually sour, more sour. Um, they leave it out for a long time, which I love creme fraiche. It's a very fancy version of saying sour cream. So it's just creme fraiche is like this with a lemon squeeze in it, basically, and it's got a big pop. So you can absolutely use creme fraiche instead of crema, and it would just be fancy schmancy enchiladas. It would be delicious. You would have to just invite me over, basically, is all I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Um, well, you guys, I, I, I think we hit up most of the questions, unless there's anyone else. But I do want to ask you guys to throw this up on Instagram. Definitely take a picture of it. Tag me. Tag the USO. Um, we would love to reshare it and celebrate you guys. I, I really do believe that the key to a happy house and to a happy life is homemade cooking. And so to be able to make something like this, bring it to the table is so, so gratifying. Um, and for you guys who I know are at home with families or, or supporting your spouse who's in the military, I just, you deserve to have an incredible meal and to eat incredibly. So thank you so, so much, uh, Liz and Nicole and Mari for the opportunity to be here. We're gonna be doing this quarterly, so we're gonna have more to come. Um, I would love suggestions between now and then of what you wanna learn. We're totally open to it. We still want to stick to the five by five challenge because I think it's easy and it's you guys can rock it out no matter where you are. But I'm just so grateful for everything that you guys do to protect this country. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate you. So thank you so much. And I'll uh, pass it back to Liz. Thank you so much, Chef Joel. Everybody how about another virtual round of applause for Chef Joel. And for yourselves, thank you for cooking along with us. I can't wait to see your pictures. I can't wait to, to look on social media and see how these turned out. If you all haven't found our USO Military Spouse Facebook group yet, go ahead and open up Facebook and search for it. It's just called USO Military Spouse. And you can join that group. And we've got tons of good stuff that we share in there that's happening at our centers and virtually for everybody around the world. Um, thank you all so much for being here with us today. We sure appreciate it. We'll hang out for another few minutes if there are any other questions. Otherwise, you can go to uso.org forward slash military spouse to find out what's coming up next. Like Chef Joel said, we're going to be here quarterly. We hope to do this again in June or July. We'll hit you up right in the middle of PCS season when you're desperate for what am I going to make next for my family? I have no idea. Uh, we're here for you, and we're so glad that you were here with us today. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. To Chef Joel and the homemade team, thank you guys for everything, and we'll see you all this summer. Thank you all. Can't wait till summer grilling. Woo! See y'all.